this will come as a great shock to many of you, but Jesus of Nazareth was not an Englishman. I know that is a startling revelation, but he didn't speak English. He came from the eastern Mediterranean region. He would have spoken Aramaic and some Greek. He was Jewish and he wasn't white. It's most likely he was brown or olive skinned. Now, the reason I'm uh, laboring that is that over the centuries, Jesus in the West was certainly made into looking like a white Englishman, often, often an Englishman, but not necessarily, but certainly white. Now, at one level, that's a perfectly natural process that each culture will take its significant religious figures and clothe them in shades and forms that they're used to. It's part of expressing the message of that religious tradition in a way that is uh, acceptable. But in the case of the West, the white Jesus, who resembled a 19th century Englishman with long hair, became a vehicle for racism and for uh, colonial exploitation. Now, I'll say a bit more about that in, in a second, but the, the, the point I'm raising now is I, I want us to explore racism and the fact that racism is learned. The fact that it can be learned means that it can be unlearned. And if you have a brief look at Western history, you'll see part of Western racism included uh, the role of religion, and in particular the role of the church. There's been some really interesting work done on the slave trade in the 18th century in the West Indies. And there, the Church of England played a key role in propagating the black and white divisions in culture not only in culture, but in worship, in liturgical and religious practices. And in many instances uh, throughout the world, and we only have to think of the role of the church in pre-apartheid South Africa, the church didn't amble, necessarily amble up behind the political intrigues, but often the church was a, a, a leading spokesperson for political uh, intrigues and also a vehicle of racism. But my point is racism can be unlearned. There's a remarkable story in the Gospels which I, I think has, has power because implicit in the story is an element of racism on the part of Jesus himself. It comes from the Gospel of Mark chapter 17 chapter 7 verses 24 to 30 and it's the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, she's a woman who uh, is worried about her daughter and wants uh, Jesus to heal her daughter. Now the key thing is though the in, in the rhetoric of the story is a series of contrasts. You have prior to this story Jesus the Jewish prophet the Jewish teacher who's been assailed by Jewish leaders and in the process he's uh, clarifying his message, his purpose, his uh, vocation. And in the mind of Jesus his vocation is to uh, bring the good news of the reign of God to the Jewish people, to fulfill Jewish promises and Jewish uh, expectations. Now. In this small story, racism, in a sense, adds power to the story and is also an example of the capacity for us to learn. And in this case, it's Jesus who does the learning. The writer is at pains to make the contrast between Jesus and this Greek woman, the Jewish prophet, and this Syrophoenician woman. She is a Gentile. She is not of the Jewish tradition. So when she implores Jesus for help, his response is to say, well, hang on a second. 
my mission is to the Jewish people. I'm, I'm offering to them the banquet of God. That's my task. That's my purpose. It's not for the Gentiles. And immediately, this Gentile woman, this Syrophoenician woman, in a sense, uh, certainly challenges Jesus, if not rebukes him by saving, saying that even the dogs under the table receive the crumbs, receive the children's crumbs. It's, it, it's a remarkable uh, response. And it catches Jesus off guard. And in the end, the, the climax of the story, of course, is that he recognises a remarkable depth of faith in this woman. And in a sense, he, his own limitations, the fact that he there's some stuff here he has to unlearn. He, in recognising the wisdom and faith of this woman, he has to acknowledge that there are certain uh, cultural blinkers that he has on, racial blinkers that stopped him initially from engaging in this woman. This is really a remarkable story. It's a remarkable story that is included because in many ways it's the Syro Syrophoenician woman who is the great teacher, although it is to Jesus' credit that he's willing to recognise that he has something here to learn. Racism is endemic. Uh, it's endemic in the world. Um, the West didn't invent racism. We don't own racism. But as a Western figure, that, that's the culture I have to deal with. That's the culture that, for many of us, we have to, to deal with. And racism is an intrinsic part of uh, Western culture especially when you look at the last few centuries from the Enlightenment onwards and the uh, colonial, the drive of colonialism throughout most of the world went hand in hand with certain racial and uh, religious uh, convictions and it led to massive, massive exploitation of other cultures and millions and millions of other people. It was uh, profoundly violent and destructive. This week in Australia is a very significant uh, week because we celebrate our black history. <clears throat> and by that, I'm holding up black history as a thing to be proud of. Australia is the, the, the home of peoples who have been here for 65,000 years. And Australia itself is going through a process of new learning. There, there are really significant issues of social justice that we have uh, yet to address, and the most obvious one is the significance of black deaths in custody. And of course, until we have justice in areas like that, until we bring about appropriate structural changes, there will never be a genuine reconciliation. But this week we celebrate the richness of the cultures associated with Aboriginal peoples and the Torres Strait Islanders. We, we celebrate the, the, the value of the land and of the sea. We, we honour their appreciation of the complexity of nature, the importance of spirituality, an appreciation of community and, and respect for others. Uh, there's such a richness. And what is really exciting in the last 10 or 20 years is that there has been a shift in Australian culture from an element of condescension. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, we had these kind of initiatives. But I suspect that initially, uh, many white Australians were at least implicitly rather patronising to what was seen as uh, token gestures. What's happened in uh, recent years is the pennies dropped. And many Australians of all persuasions, and we are a multicultural country, have seen the richness of Aboriginal and Islander cultures. And, and that they have so much to teach us. A very recent example is we've had horrific problems 
with bushfires in Australia, which made uh, the attention of global newspapers. Uh, we're not alone in this, and we, we feel for uh, our friends in California. But it's certainly been a major problem in Australia. Now, Aboriginal cultures have managed the land and managed the bush carefully and creatively for thousands of years, and that included uh, a technique of having uh, controlled and measured burnings of the bush to keep it in check. And so in recent years, our fire chiefs, our fire commissioners, those are the people in charge of our major fire defence units in different states and different regions, have gone to Aboriginal leaders to learn about these techniques. And this is what I mean, that the, the, the penny has dropped. So we've shifted from a position of thinking, well, this is a nice thing to learn about Aboriginal culture, to goodness me, we have so much to learn. And that shift, I think, has meant that there is a greater uh, openness, a more genuine relationship, and a genuine sense of equality between peoples within Australia. This means that there is a real chance for new learning. Racism is a problem in most cultures in the world, and it is learned. I just want to conclude on that note when, with a small story, if you can allow the indulgence of a grandfather. We have two grandsons, and recently our six-year-old grandson came up to us overjoyed. He wanted to describe to us his uh, new friend. At that age, I mean, they're always making new friends, new best friends. But it's quite wonderful when they they come home and they want to share uh, their experience. And so he told us about this new friend, uh, Tim. And he gave us a wonderful description of that Tim had a sense of humour. He was bright. He was good at sport. They were best friends. They did things at lunchtime at resource. I think we even learnt something about uh, the professional occupation of Tim's parents. Now, what was really interesting was that it was only days after that we heard from our grandson about his, his new best friend, Tim, that we discovered Tim, in our eyes, was Chinese-Australian. So in my generation, we've been brought up to think that we've come to terms with multiculturalism, but often our instinct is not to say this person is Australian, but they, he or she is Chinese-Australian or Italian-Australian. What was fascinating for me is that for our grandson, the question of racial difference, the question of colour, didn't occur to him at all. He embraced his friend Tim as Tim. And it was a salutary lesson to me that racism is learned. Over the centuries, the church in the West has very much been a white church. Our leaders have been predominantly white. We've taught the white gospel and we have propagated the Jesus who looks like a 19th century Englishman. But Jesus was Jewish and Jesus was caught up in his own culture. We've been given a gift, though, in the gospel with the story of the Syro-Phoenician woman. And in that story, the Syro-Phoenician woman is the wise one. She is the person of faith. And because of her compassion and love for her daughter, she breaks all the social rules. And on the basis of faith, she challenges Jesus. And implicitly in the story, it's Jesus' own racism that gets in the way. Perhaps then the climax of the story is that Jesus was big enough to recognise that he needed to learn something about other people. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. Amen.